I have an announcement. It's actually a bad one. We have a problem. We definitely have a huge problem. Uh, and the problem is that we are about to enter a situation when bacterial infections can't be cured. Uh, and you see this in the news, right? You see this everywhere. It's uh, every second day you see these dramatic uh, highlights. Bug resistant to all antibiotics kills woman. Is this exaggerated? Unfortunately not. So uh, the predictions are pretty sad. Right now, 700,000 people die every year from antibacterial resistance. And these are bacteria where physi physicians have secured that, okay, the death is due to a bacteria that wasn't cured with antibiotics. It, it was resistant. But of course, millions are dying for infe from infections due to that they don't get treatment. That's another risk. But look, look at this. The prediction is that in 2050, 10 million will die every year. 10 million. This is really, really sad numbers. And of course, the cost is, is I can't even say that, 100 trillion dollars. It's dramatic, OK? So what is antibiotics and antibiotic resistance? I like to, to show two pioneers, two heroes, two really great scientists which have, have resulted in a situation that we used to have. These were, were the big ones discovering antibiotics. Domac, he was the one behind the sulfa drugs that several of you have heard about and, and is still sometimes an antibiotic that we use. He received the Nobel Prize 39, but the Nazis didn't allow him to accept it, so he, he, the war has to, had to end until he could get it 47. And then we have Fleming. And now I'm not talking about the one who, who uh, discovered, or what we should say, James Bond. We are talking about Alexander Fleming and uh, the discovery of the penicillins from a mold, from, from uh, uh, microorganisms. And this started the era of antibiotics. So from the World War II, a lot of antibiotics were discovered from different microorganisms, from bacteria, natural products, and also f very few synthetic ones. But it stopped at 1970. This was cured. We had, it, we had it solved. We had enough types of antibiotics to cure all infections. And we had a gap until recently when we realized the big problem. Because what happens? All the antibiotics used, they kill or stop growth of bacteria. Sounds pretty nice because we get sick, right? But unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know how to, how to say it, but uh, we are half bacteria and half humans if we start to count cell by cell. You sitting there have two kilograms of bacteria in the gut flora, and they help you to, to create, to, you know, make vitamins to, well, we can't survive without them. So that is one problem. We throw in a bomb and also start to kill the good ones. I will show you now how resistance can, uh, can uh, happen. And this is a beautiful illustration, actually a movie that you can check later on. It's uh, by Metal from Harvard, and they published this in Science. So what you see is a huge Petri dish with agar, an agar that is, you know, a smurgus bud for bacteria. They can chew on this and s divide and have fun, right? The problem is that uh, these guys, they added antibiotics to it, so they will add the bacteria in the ends, and then uh, after a while they will start to hit one times more than they can survive. Ten times, hundred, thousand. Of course, the bacteria grew fine, no antibiotics, the smurgus bud was there. But look at this. When they hit the antibiotic, one clone was there, resistant to that level of antibiotic. And look at the space. Wow, I can grow, and then I can grow, and I can grow. 11 days, 11 days was what, what's needed to be able to survive in 1,000 times 
what they could survive from the beginning. And this is resistance in its kind of how it is. And again, what's common for all these is that they kill or stop growth. And then you will have this selection pressure out there. So bad news, but are there alternatives? Yes, there are alternatives. And there are many researchers out there looking for alternatives. Uh, the, the title of the talk is actually inspired by a, by a number of researchers in Oslo, Tune Tunium and others, that have created a network for antimicrobial resistance. So we, I will now introduce you the approach to disarm the bacteria. Does it sound nice? Yes, it's friendly. We, we don't kill it, we don't stop growth, but we specifically go in and hit uh, what they need to cause disease. So look at this. This is a project I've done together with my best friend Scott Halkren, and uh, he's, by the way, an amazing researcher. And look at this. This is, uh, I, I think it's so beautiful. So it's, it's, actually, <laughs> it's actually E. coli, urinary tract infection, but look at the immune system. Isn't it amazing? It's like a Star Wars movie. Boom! Right? And this is what happens. I mean, now when you're laughing and, and breathing, you get thousands of bacteria in there. But the immune system is good. It's fantastic. The problem with the, with the E. coli and urinary tract infection, they don't just want to go into the urine like we wouldn't. Uh, but if they end up there, they need to start a colony. So what do they need? They have to withstand shear forces because we pee, right? So they make these fantastic hairy structures. They are like springs, so they can withstand shear forces. They can hang around there in the urinary tract. And on top of that, uh, by having this hair, they can penetrate and go into the urinary tract and cause disease. Now it's obvious to you, right? Remove those hairs. Of course. So uh, a long story short, by, by really dissecting the machinery and how these fibers are formed, we were able to specially design molecules that could remove this ability to form hairs. These bacteria were so happy growing exactly as the others, but they were bold and happy. <laughs> right, so that's one example, and a typically an example that you should use if you don't die from the infection. We need antibiotics and spare them for those cases when we get bloodstream infections septic shock, we die in a couple of hours. Urinary tract infection, oh, not nice, but I can treat it carefully with a disarming approach. Okay, so to the next uh, thing, Th this is also, of course, what happens out there in the nature. So if you have antibiotics, you will have this gradient of pressure in the environment. We overuse antibiotics to produce food. 70% of the antibiotics is used over here and not to treat people. When we get the antibiotics, we pee out 50%. From factories producing antibiotics, it's leakage, right? And there will be a selection pressure for resistance. But with a disarming approach, nothing happens. That's what we hope, at least. Okay, so to the next uh, and my last example, and, and probably the most important, tuberculosis. This is really a bad bug, the sheaf among pathogens. This bacteria kills one and a half million a year. But look at this, it's ridiculous. A third of the world population carry around with tuberculosis. Half a million, close to, get multi-resistant tuberculosis. They have to be isolated. They have to chew on these tablets. This is an antibiotic. 14,600 tablets to cure uh, maybe one of these. And this mounts up, I mean, people change apparently, but the Golden Gate Bridge is still th the same height. And, uh, uh, if you mount out these, these tablets on top of each other, they build up to the height of, of the Golden Gate Bridge. Isn't it ridiculous? 
to treat one person. It's tons. So can we do anything? Uh, together with Christina, she is as, as great as she looks, and uh, we, she is a molecular biologist, we are chemists, and joined forces to understand how tuberculosis can be cured, or at least how we can make antibiotic work again, as maybe someone would say. Uh, so what we have done is to carefully look at how tuberculosis works. So this is what happens. They, they are airborne, they go into the lungs. Once there, you saw the immune system kick in, right? But these bugs can interact with the immune system. Bum, ba, bum. They don't die. So what happens next is uh, we start to form capsules and encapsulate these bacteria into uh, these granuloma. No one can survive in there would, would be my impression because this is terrible. No oxygen is coming in anymore. The pH is getting lowered. Oxidative stress is kicking in. It's really bad to be there. No bacteria would survive, but TB does. TB does. And it's not just surviving, it starts to change. So it's changing its outer lipid layer and start to be tolerant and resistant to both the immune system and to antibiotics. So once they are exposed again and come out, they are really hard to beat. But we have, together with Christina, develop molecules that prohibit, attenuate this process of TB to convert to this tolerant state. And we call them tolerance inhibitors. I know, I, but it's what we call them. <laughs> but the effect is actually dramatic. So we have checked many different things. Uh, look, uh, over here you have a control, a plate, an agar plate with tuberculosis. It grows like crazy. Well slow, but it grows. And look at this. This the, is the plate with our tolerance inhibitor. S we don't see much difference, right? They still seem to grow, but we know they don't change. And this is the trick. Because look down here. This is a plate containing isoniacid. And isoniacid is the frontline antibiotic for tuberculosis. Would you be happy if you had this uh, situation? I guess not, because you still see colonies. These are resistant to this cure. They would continue making you sick. But look at the combination. So if you take the tolerance inhibitor together with the isoniacid, boom, it's blank. No, no TB is there. You cannot count any colony units there. And to challenge this further, we uh, took an isoniacid resistance strain. I mean, check over here. It's a dramatic growth of uh, tuberculosis on this plate with isoniacid. But look at it, right? The combination works also with this isoniacid resistance strain. So we are extremely happy, and this is, of course, yes, the proof of concept, but nothing that we really believe would be possible. So we are extremely excited about this. So to sum up, what I hope you can all, I mean, this is something for us researchers, of course. And I really acknowledge all scientists out there doing basic science, trying to understand things. That's what your tax money goes to. I hope you loved it. I also would like to acknowledge all these uh, grant holders that give grants for science. But you can also make a difference. Of don't push your, your physicians to get antibiotics if you just have a you know, throat illness or something like that. And if you're in, the, in another part of the world where you don't need a physician to prescribe the antibiotic, don't just buy it on the internet. It's probably crap anyway. But, but don't uh, buy it and, and use it if, if not necessary. And, of course, the easy things, don't uh, buy food that has been produced with antibiotics, if you have an option. 
we are not that for all that fortunate that we have options, but we who, who have an option don't eat food produced by antibiotics. Well, by, but with the help of antibiotics. And, and another easy thing for us with fresh water, use good hygiene. I hope I have convinced you that uh, by specially designed molecules, chemistry, we have been able to make tuberculosis work again. We can hit them. And in the case of a urinary tract infection, we have shown you an example where we, instead of killing it, just make it bald, right? So with that, thank you.